today is uh, key challenges in treatment and management of uh, patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension and uh, it's a uh, huge topic so i think i'll try and cover as much as possible in the next uh, one hour i have divided the uh, presentation into two parts one is uh, counseling of the patients with pulmonary hypertension and i think this is uh, one of the most uh, important and a uh, hugely neglected part of managing patients uh, with pulmonary hypertension and part two is medications and surgical options uh, current surgical options which are uh, available in uh, available for uh, treating patients with pulmonary hypertension and we'll see how it goes along so first is part 1 it's first one is extremely important as to how we are going to counsel the patients and their caregivers uh, for treating patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension whenever you are in a pulmonary hypertension clinic and talking to patients and their caregivers with pulmonary hypertension uh, it is extremely important to know what uh, we are going to talk to them and it is the most important part of treating a patient with pulmonary hypertension anxiety and fear of death are the most common concerns so you are talking about a disease which is uh, probably not treatable unless you find a cause for it and uh, it is like uh, a death sentence you know because uh, it's even worse than cancer because cancer at least in stage 1 and 2 uh, you can give the patient hope and say that okay you might be treatable but here it is uh, like a stage 4 uh, uh, stage 4 tumor and it's like a death sentence we're telling the telling the patient that we don't have anything to offer to you probably and uh, you might uh, with the medications you uh, might survive for some time but uh, ultimately uh, it's going to lead to an early death and that is the most common concern and once uh, uh, that is uh, conveyed to the parents or the uh, or the family Uh, it is extremely depressing and it's extremely uh, uh, difficult for the family to uh, to adjust spending time with the family and reassurance is extremely important uh, you see the counseling times uh, the first time we see a patient with pulmonary hypertension in the ph clinic uh, the first counseling by itself will take you approximately an hour and hour and a half and it's just talking and understanding and telling the family what the disease is what treatment options are available and how we are going to go with that so uh, this was there was a study which was done in 2013 and it was uh, it had showed that uh, once the patients uh, that have a pulmonary hypertension it affects the patients, not only the patients but even givers there is a definite it on employment so uh, in current scenario in your families where both the mother and the uh, father are working if you are going to tell that one of your child has got a disease which is probably not curable and uh, he might drop dead any time definitely uh, it is uh, one of the parents would probably have to give up on their employment or change the nature of their uh, employment and once that is done that is probably going to uh, have a reduction in the household income and as we all know pulmonary hypertensive medicines are are pretty costly and uh, uh uh it might become a challenge for the parents to manage both the fronts that leads to is uh, probably a uh, uh, depression so there's a uh, functional impairment there is in the quality of life uh, the parents and the and the caregivers don't cope up with the uh, with the uh, medicine consequently uh, leading to non compliance disease exacerbation and ultimately leading to depression so uh, if you see the prevalence of anxiety and depression in pulmonary hypertension uh, patients and the changes during therapy if you see the patients who are uh, incident there is approximately 52% uh, uh, chances that the patient or their caregiver is going into depression and another 51 point also having anxiety however in uh, in the prevalent patients so those who are already having pulmonary hypertension have accepted the disease the incidence is much less what depression also does is who are having uh, depression if you see in this 
they are having the one year survival is only around 70% whereas those who had coped up the disease uh, better the chances of survival are much more so uh, depression is not only a mental phenomenon it also kind of affects their day to day life the medications which they are taking and ultimately can lead to uh, uh, can lead to uh, decreased survival sounds so we found the patient so th this was a survey which was done in a ph clinic and was published again in 2013 and uh, the parents want to know or the patients want to know is information about the disease definitely informations of the drugs options and the medications which can be used and the surgical options available information about the administrative consequences of the disease like what is going to happen to the disease how is it going to progress what is going to have uh, effect on the on the functional capacity of the patient information about travel about depression anxiety risk and other emotional consequences and we were one, one by one all of these in the counseling session so uh, <clears throat> the patients and their caregivers have to adjust their daily activities to meet new challenges exit participation in sports adage pregnancy contraception travel vaccination or the medical care and we will come to each of them in detail Uh, their daily activities to meet daily challenges. As I said, if one of the parents has to give up work, I mean, if one of the kids of a nuclear family has got pulmonary hypertension, the first uh, question is going to come to one of the parents: Is can we work? Can work in a different way? So yes, definitely the parents can work, but they have just your routine. Might be able to work from home. Various options are available. Self-employment can consider working for free with the goal of networking. Next exercise and, and play. The next question is, uh, Doc, my child has got severe pulmonary hypertension. Can I allow him or her to play with other kids, or should we just restrict them at home? So uh, yes, definitely you can allow him to play. Okay. What is in what initially believed was exercise and play would have negative impact on the progression of the disease of pulmonary hypertension and could lead to sudden cardiac death because the child is. is in his walking and can have a sudden spurt of pulmonary hypertension crisis and can suddenly stop and can suddenly drop her lack of exercise and play increases anxiety and depression the increase in weight and consequently there is a uh, 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 progression of pulmonary hypertension so training and exercises improves endothelial function improves quality of life so this published in circulation 2006 in they showed that a graded physical uh, size had a positive impact on the patient's 6 minute walk test uh, uh, at baseline and when the patients uh, uh, who did not have uh, a physical exercise t- uh, testing there was a negative uh, uh, change in the 6 minute walk test and when this patients underwent after 16 weeks underwent yoga and physical training all of them showed improvement in functional class and improvement in 6 minute walk test okay this was meta analysis which was recently published i think in 2015 and it shows uh, in most of the studies showed beneficial effect of this walk test on uh, 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 on uh, so the effect of physical training on a beneficial effect of physical training on 6 minute walk test and exercise in patients uh, what happens to uh, the pa pressures uh, during exercise so most of the patients there is not much change uh, with the peak systolic pressure and rb function on uh, maximal exercise and especially if the patient is well controlled on pulmonary vasodilator therapy however this increase in peak exercise rate uh, and so that is why we should always tell the patients that they should, should play sports they should participate in sports but they should not participate in competitive sports because in competitive sports what happens is the child would not know when to stop or the uh, competitiveness doesn't allow the child to Uh, stop when tired. So, what we tell the parents is, yes, your child can play, but he should take rest whenever he is feeling tired, and that is extremely important. And hence, avoid uh, competitive sports. Now, the side effects of uh, 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 on patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension undergoing exercise testing. So, most of the studies have shown that there is no side effect. on patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension on exercise uh, uh, exercise uh, conditioning so should we recommend first pulmonary rehabilitation program can be done for a slightly ill child uh, who is uh, in the teenage group uh, can undergo 
combined with light exercises, a dedicated three-week program with light aerobic exercise like walking and leisure cycling, body training with light weights, swimming helpful but never un unsupervised. Yoga and breathing exercises definitely are allowed. The important thing is you should not participate in competitive sports. Next one is marriage and pregnancy. As we all know that uh, pulmonary hypertension usually occurs in, uh, in girls at that too, uh, mostly in the uh, teenage or early 20s. So the next important question is what is going to happen to marriage and contraception? So can I marry or can my uh, child marry? Second is can, can they have intercourse? And the third is can they have children? Whether the children of my child are going to also have the risk of having pulmonary hypertension, especially if we don't know what is the cause of pulmonary hypertension. So the question, can I marry and can I have intercourse? Yes, definitely you can marry and definitely you can have intercourse, but always advisable to completely inform your prospective spouse about the disease and marriage counseling is essential uh, when you're going to into marriage. Pregnancy and conception. Pregnancy is associated with a very high morbidity and mortality, and I, I'll come to it uh, in the later slides. Mortality is ranging from approximately 30 to 50 percent, and usually in the postpartum period. And hence, pregnancy is absolutely contraindicated in patients with pulmonary hypertension. So, why we are so much concerned about pregnancy in pulmonary hypertension? See, in, preg in pregnancy, as the pregnancy progresses, there is increase in cardiac output and the decrease in systemic vascular resistance. Uh, what the increase in cardiac output does uh, to a normal heart is able to cope with the increase in cardiac output, where in patients who are having pulmonary hypertension, the RV is not able to cope up and leads to uh, uh, dilatation and hypertrophy of the right heart. Uh, what it also does, there are a lot of endocrinal changes. There are uh, There is hypoxia because the diaphragm is shifted up. There is hypovolemia and volume shift. There is pulmonary vascular remodeling. All of these leads to right ventricular dysfunction and failure. However, this is probably slowly, slowly changing uh, in the developed world. So in the developed world, if you see, uh, in the in the era before 1996, the uh, death rate due to pregnancy, uh, especially with uh, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, was somewhere in the range of 30%, which has dropped to 17% now. And associated uh, uh, hypertension, congenital heart, heart disease, and pulmonary hypertension again of 36 percent and it has dropped down to 28 percent however this is probably not true in the indian scenario and i'll tell you why so patients with uh, 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 with pulmonary hypertension and pregnancy is first is counsel in the pregnancy risk discuss therapeutic options recommend uh, uh, for abortion however if the patients continue to uh, have pregnancy we need to change their medication. And what do we need to have? Do we need to stop endothelial receptor antagonists because they are teratogenic? Now, once you stop endothelial receptor antagonists in India, you're only left with phosphodiesterase inhibitors, that is sildenafil and bosentan, and in or sildenafil and tadalafil. And in very, 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 very rare cases, when the patient is responsive to nitric oxide, you can also use calcium channel blockers. However, the first thing is we're going to stop endothelial receptor antagonist, and in absence of prostacyclin analogs, this pregnancy is going to be a hell to manage. A multidisciplinary uh, team approach. It's not that we have not done pregnancies, uh, we have not managed pregnancies with pulmonary hypertension, but it's really, really uh, difficult. So you have to optimize it, and it requires a multidisciplinary uh, team approach, which is required. Uh, third trimester. Go for an active uh, LSCS with an epidural anesthesia uh, uh, at approximately 34 to 36 weeks, and to post-operative monitoring in the ICU. Most of the most of the deaths occur in the immediate post-operative period, in between the first two to three weeks after pregnancy uh, uh, has uh, after the uh, baby has been delivered. It's extremely important to have multidisciplinary approach, and uh, the pregnancy has to be that in the center where, uh, uh, where these facilities are really available. Pulmonary vasodilators, as I said, calcium channel blocker is safe, but it can only be used in patients who are vasoreactive. Fossil inhibitors, sildenafil, tadalafil are safe during pregnancy. End receptor antagonists have teratogenic effects and I have to be stopped during pregnancy. So first trimester, you have to stop at the receptor antagonist. Prostacycline analogs are safe, but not easily available in India. 
as i said you you will work elective lscs with an epidural anesthesia post mortem closely monitor the patient in the cardiac icu i do have a swan gas i will fill the film milden known as nitric oxide have to be started and have to be given according to the pa pressures and rv function and process cyclines need to be available if we need to use it during the post mortem period Next, contraception avoiding pregnancy is imperative. As we have seen, that the mortality rates range from 30 to 50 percent, and maybe in the in our countries, in absence of even procedures, methods are safe, but there are high failure rates if used alone. Hormonal methods such as uh, estrogen they increase the risk of thromboembolism. Progesterone-only pills or implants are effective with no additional risk, so they can be used. In a device. are effective and safe with the risk of vasovagal syncope however there is a risk of vasovagal syncope during insertion uh, however this can be done in a uh, in a center which is equipped to manage pulmonary hypertensive crisis uh, and uh, by far i think intrauterine devices are probably one of the better uh, better uh, contraceptive uh, to use in pregnancy sterilization are safe and preferred in some centers tubal ligation is uh, good very low failure rate uh, or we can think out of the box and consider for male sterilization emergency contraception is absolutely not recommended there is a high risk of thromboembolism and uh, in that scenario also an intrauterine device might be preferable this travel and its next question is going to come is can i travel with pulmonary hypertension and in the world travel is imperative because uh, Uh, the world is so small, and people have to travel for uh, uh, or leisure as well as uh, their work activities, and hence uh, travel in the current scenario is imperative. Avoid the use of low low oxygen. So avoid uh, uh, very high uh, altitude areas such as Kashmir, Leh, and Ladakh. Even deep sea diving is completely contraindicated in patients with pulmonary hypertension. Road and rail travel is relatively safe. What about travel? so if you are saying that high altitude is contraindicated is air travel also contraindicated in patients with pulmonary hypertension so keep in some pressurized and patients ex- patients experience this situation because kids are pressurized at approximately 4000 or 4000 to 4000 feet uh, in the older generation aircraft and the current generation aircraft is approximately around 3000 feet and once that is done there is definite desaturation uh, the fio2 is not 21% at this uh, Mm, at this uh, cruising altitude uh, there is a decrease in uh, oxygen saturation by as much as 2 to 50 uh, 2 to 15 percent uh, uh, and this baseline oxygen saturation at the sea level is going to correspond with the desaturation in the air so uh, so this was a study which was published in chest 2012 and which showed that uh, there was a decrease in oxygen saturation Uh, and if you can see as much as uh, the oxygen saturation had dropped to 75 percent in some of the patients at, <coughs> at cruising altitude, and once the and once the flight lands, the saturation improves. Travel, yes, there is hypoxia during flight. Does travel into adverse events? So that is what is important. And if that so, is air travel that contraindicated in patients with pulmonary hypertension? So this was a study which was again published in uh, just recently published in Heart 2017 and shows that yes there is desaturation during during uh, cruising altitude but that does not usually change usually uh, result in uh, in the increase uh, in RV function so even though the, there is hypoxia even though there is uh, increase in the PA pressure there uh, the RV function is relatively well maintained in most patients with pulmonary hypertension so how do we uh, how do we tackle this problem air travel can be undertaken but with some precautions supplemental oxygen avoid flights which are more than 8 hours duration avoid alcohol in teenage patients keep hydrated take frequent walks to prevent deep venous thrombosis next vaccination and other medication all patients with pulmonary hypertension have to have pneumococcal vaccine h influenza vaccine and allergy flu vaccine good hygiene and effective endocarditis especially in ph patients with congenital heart disease patient has to go uh, uh, to go to go any other non cardiac surgery there is definite risk of anesthesia so with pulmonary hypertension are at risk of having adverse events to anesthesia and surgery multidisciplinary work and judicious use of drugs can prevent most of the complications and preoperative assessment by a peer 
uh, by a PH specialist is essential. Identifying the high risk procedures and uh, and patients is quite essential because if a patient is treatment naive, this patient with RV dysfunction is definitely going to be at a much higher risk than a patient who is uh, having a normal uh, near normal RV function and less than half systemic PA pressure. The anesthetic drugs to be used, uh, I think. Uh, uh, who are on volatile, who are uh, who uh, who were used volatile agents, they were a very high risk of adverse events. So either ketamine alone or ketamine with propofol are the preferred uh, agents to be used. In our own experience, we had done 75 cardiac catheterizations. Uh, total, we had six cardiac events, and uh, major events were three in which two patients had hypotension, which response responded to fluid volatile and one which required cardiopulmonary resuscitation. This patient was treatment naive, had suprasystemic peer pressure and severe RV dysfunction. This patient went on to ECMO and had a lung transplant. Patient groups virtually not existent in India. Pulmonary Hypertension Association of North America is a very vibrant group of patients and their caregivers with pulmonary hypertension. And plenty of educational material is available both for the patient as well as their caregivers. We ourselves are trying to uh, uh, make an app uh, which is uh, called as Active Living with Pulmonary Hypertension for the patients and their caregivers. And it will tell the patient as, as to what exactly pulmonary hypertension is and how we can uh, uh, how can treat pulmonary hypertension. So after coming to that, and I think that was the most important part of the talk because nobody really talks about uh, counseling of the patient with pulmonary hypertension. That's why I thought that I should put it in the section one. Uh, in the section two, I think it is going to be more interesting. The section one was a little bit more boring, but the section two is what is what we are going to do day in, day out. What management strategies in pulmonary hypertension, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, endothelial receptor antagonists, and what is beyond these two. What we are going to talk in this session. Uh, first important drug, calcium blocker. How it should be only used in patients who have undergone a vasodilator testing. So remember, vasodilator testing is absolutely essential before we start anybody on calcium channel blocker. There is there are only around seven to eight percent of the patients who are going to be vasodilator responsive, and only these patients are going to be benefited by calcium channel blockers. There will be another thirty to forty percent in which not going to be any change with calcium channel blockers and many 50 percent we are actually going to harm because once you start the calcium channel blockers the patient can have a decrease in cardiac output it is absolutely essential to do a vasodilator testing with either inhaled nitric oxide adenosine or epipenol before we start uh, uh, a patient on calcium channel blocker what they have to be used there are various criteria which are available the there, but they have, we have to understand, we have to be very, very stringent in this criteria. The reason is uh, calcium channel blockers are not active in all patients. So what criteria we use in adult patient who is at a teenage group, we uh, use this criteria which was described by Stibon et al. Uh, that is decrease in mean PA pressure of at least 10 millimeter of mercury to less than 40 millimeters of mercury. The bottom line is the PA pressure has to fall uh, to less than 40 millimeters of mercury with increase or no change in cardiac output. The one which we use in adult patients. In pediatric patients, we use the BAS criteria which says that the decrease in the mean PA pressure by 20% with increase or no change in cardiac output. We also have to remember the patients with congenital heart disease and pulmonary hypertension, currently there is no evidence to use calcium channel blockers. And we can use inhaled nitric oxide, iloprost or adenosine for uh, doing the pulmonary vasodilator testing. And we see the patients who have a long-term favorable response to calcium channel blockers are definitely have much better prognosis. If you see the patients who are long-term response to calcium channel blockers at 18 years, their survival is close to 90%, whereas the others who are non-responsive to calcium channel blockers or non-responsive to acute basal testing, the prognosis is really, 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 really bad. Next is endothelial receptor antagonist. So various available in the market right now. Non-selective such as bosentan, selective such as amblycentan and macentan. Bosentan is one of the one of the first one to be used. It is a non-selective because it inhibits both endothelial receptor A as well as B uh, receptors. The dose is one to two milligrams per kg twice daily. Uh, 
Six randomized control trials have, uh, have demonstrated beneficial effects on functional capacity and hemodynamics. However, when person of the patients who have elevated liver enzymes because of Bosentan, and hence a monthly LFT is absolutely essential in patients who are started on Bosentan therapy. This was a uh, study which was published in uh, Circulation 2006, and this was known as the Breathe, uh, Breathe 5 study, and in which we have, uh, in which the uh, authors have shown and uh, definite improvement, decrease in the pulmonary vascular resistance after uh, uh, six weeks of therapy, improvement in six-minute walk test after the same duration therapy. So uh, not only there is only increase in six-minute walk test, but also there is definite decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance brief and after uh, Bosentan therapy. So, so yes, endothelial receptor antagonists can be used in patients with pulmonary hypertension. The newer endothelial receptor antagonist, Ambrisentan, is the endothelial receptor A. a. Advantages is single dose, single daily dose, and the patotoxic effects are seen only in 0.22%. So in the study which was published, uh, I think in 2009, then, uh, and uh, uh, there was uh, the liver function uh, deterioration was in patients with ambrosentan was similar to that in placebo. So uh, the companies say that you don't need to monitor liver function tests, but we should do it at least six monthly to once a year in patients who because we never know which patient is going to have liver function liver dysfunction. Uh, peripheral edema and it is teratogenic and it and has to be stopped in patients who are in childbearing age. So in children. So there is a single uh, study which has shown uh, beneficial effects of ambrosentan in children and the dose which we normally use if the child is less than 20 kilograms is a 2.5 milligrams and the child is more than 20 milligrams we start with 5 milligram, 5 milligram and consider hydration if it is tolerated well. But we have to remember that we cannot use ambrosentan in children who are less than 2 years of age. Less than 2 years of age we only have to use Bosentan because ambrosentan requires the glycosylated uh, liver enzymes uh, which are not mature until about two years of age. So definitely not to use ambrosentan in less than two years of age and not to use ambrosentan in, in patients who are childbearing uh, uh, age who are having a uh, pregnancy or who are planning to get pregnant. Phosphodiabetes 5 inhibitors, sildenafil and cadalafil. So sildenafil, the dose is 0.5 to 1 milligrams, uh, 3 to 4 times, and we'll come to this later. There is definite improvement in 6 minute walk test, hemodynamics. Side effects are not many. Their side effects are usually common for all the subclasses, flushing, headache, and job pain. So the study which was published uh, in 2009 in children, and it has shown definite uh, beneficial effects on the systolic PA pressures as well as uh, uh, the ratio of the uh, systolic pulmonary to systolic uh, uh, systemic artery pressure in response to sildenafil. So uh, it is definitely helpful, yes, but at what dose should be used? So this study was a landmark study, I think, which was uh, published in circulation in 2012, in which they showed that patients who are on low dose of sildenafil, there was no change in function class. The people who are in high dose were not, there, there was improvement in function class, but again, there were incidence of uh, mortality and side effects in this subgroup. Currently, the only uh, uh, recommended dose is a medium, medium uh, uh, dose of in, in the hemodynamics and functional class uh, is better than high dose sildenafil and the, the incidence of side effect was low. Hence, this is what the recommendation dose uh, we are going to use. Uh, in patients who are up, who are up to 20 uh, 20 kilograms, uh, the dose which we are, which we usually use is 10 milligrams uh, three times to four times a day. In patients who are 20 to 45 milligrams, 20, maximum dose is 20 milligrams three times a day. Patients who are 40 more than 45. So basically, what we dose which we use is approximately 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg per dose, either hourly or six hourly, and we usually do not go for than one milligram per kg. What about sildenafil? So it is interesting. We see that uh, if we see uh, sildenafil has got a, a, a half life of six to seven hours, and there are certain 
certain uh, group of patients who metabolize sildenafil very, very early. It was a very, very interesting case which we, uh, when we were in, uh, uh, which we worked up, the patient actually had an ASD with uh, severe pulmonary hypertension, and this child was on sildenafil, and every time he was a TID dose of sildenafil, and every time the mother you say that before the next dose he would come and sit quietly for half an hour, 45 minutes. As soon as he takes the next dose, he becomes active again for another half an hour, 45 minutes. And once he even had a syncope, just before he had, uh, he was uh, uh, he was due for the next dose of sildenafil. And uh, when we did a cardiac cath on him, we saw that the PA pressures were nearly systemic just before the dose of sildenafil. And once we gave the dose of sildenafil, uh, the PA pressures drop down to half systemic, and hence uh, it is usually better to start a patient who again on tadalafil has got a longer half life and it has got better changes in. So if you see, there is a better control of pulmonary hypertension. There is no ups and uh, there are no uh, uh, descents, and uh, that allows for a better control of pulmonary hypertension, uh, uh, especially in children. And uh, this was again demonstrated in 2012 by uh, Akatusi et al. in which they showed a better decrease in mean PA pressure, a better decrease in PBRI, and a decrease in RPRS in patients on Tadalafil versus the same patient who was on Sildenafil. So definitely Tadalafil in children more than two, uh, two years of age again, uh, used in a dose of 0.5 to 1 milligrams, once daily dose is sufficient for patients with pulmonary hypertension. So uh, we have seen right now uh, the two of the most commonly used endothelial receptor antagonists and uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. And now you have to see what is beyond uh, these two because uh, as we all know, pulmonary hypertension is a progressive disease. And uh, once a patient is stabilized on, uh, uh, on these two drugs, there is a very, very high chance that there is a progression in the disease. It doesn't mean that once a patient is absolutely stable on these drugs, he's not going to progress. So there's a very high chance that the patient Progresses. We should know what we are going to do if the patient has got symptoms, if there is a turn in the anti pro BNP, or if there is a 6 mid walk test, or there is deterioration in the echocardiographic parameter. What are we going to do in the phosphodiesterase inhibitor and the receptor antagonist? So, first and foremost are prostacyclines, epoprosinol, triprosinol, idopros. They can be used as intravenous, subcutaneous, inhaled, and even oral route. It was the earliest drug which was shown to be effectively reduce mortality in patients with pulmonary hypertension. And it was, in fact, the first drug which was approved by US FDA in treatment of patients with pulmonary hypertension. It is very, 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 very unfortunate that Patients uh, on iloprost uh, currently, uh, six patients currently on iloprost. The last list age is three years. The dose is from five to five micrograms uh, uh, times daily. And the period is uh, approximately 12 months. And all have improved from functional class three to four to functional class two. So this is a picture you can see. This is a iloprost. It is a special, the special nebulizer is available with a mask. Usually, the children will get uh, uh, get used to using prostacyclin, and we can see this is a small child. This is the youngest child who was in prostacyclin. He was three years of age, and he is so used to prostacyclin right now that he himself uh, takes the nebulization every uh, uh, every three to four hours. But he has shown significant improvement in pulse class, uh, as well as his uh, right heart parameters, as well as his anti pro BNP after he started him on ILO. Sites are minimal, mainly headache, jaw, muscle pain, they are flushing nasal softness. These are, these are the usual complications with any pulmonary vasodilator medication. And the reason is pulmonary vasodilator medications do not only dilate pulmonary vasodilators, but they also dilate the systemic, uh, systemic uh, vasculature. So if the patient has got, uh, patient can get this terms because of uh, systemic, uh, dilatation of the systemic vessels. 
this study was at an interview which was uh, published in 2003 and it shows a significant improvement both with epoxinol as well as triprostanol in the rprs ratio so it has come down from 1 to approximately 0.5 so significant but this reason is not sustained even when you can continue the patients on palmi hypertension the uh, uh, over the time, there is increase in uh, the risk, palmi vascular resistance and the pulmonary hypertension progresses so yes the next option beyond sildenafil and bosentan is going to be uh, prostacyclines and uh, we are able to provide them at, at india currently however uh, they are very very costly and in fact at the most last for 2 years or 3 years and as the child uh, grows up this egg starts weaning and there is an increase in uh, increase in the pa pressure as well as the pbr which are now available Uh, Biosig what uh, again it increases the production of cyclic GMP and improves in exercise capacity and hemodynamics and functional class especially in thrombolytic pH but also in uh, uh, in pulmonary arterial hypertension this is currently available in India. Reward and another prostacyclin receptor antagonist is selexipac which is oral and uh, it has uh, shown uh, uh, improved in morbidity and mortality by 39% in patient with pulmonary hypertension. This is actually not available in India. but hopefully it will be able in the future what so uh, if say phosphodiesterase inhibitor phosphodiesterase inhibitor uh, will inhibit the degradation of uh, cyclic gmp to gmp so what it does it will uh, uh, it will uh, enhance or it will prolong the uh, effect of endogenous nitric oxide uh a uh, patient with pulmonary hypertension and thus leading to pulmonary dilatation however there is a small subgroup of patients who is uh who have endogenous nitric oxide deficiency this patients even if we use sildenafil they wouldn't respond to sildenafil because there is no endogenous nitric oxide in the patients there might be a rational to start the patient on cyclic uh, guanylate cyclase uh, Uh, activator or stimulator, uh, uh, which will directly uh, stimulate the guanylate cyclase receptor, as well as it will upgrade its sensitivity to endogenous nitric oxide. So it's very exciting, and we might be able to use it. We have currently switched three patients from sildenafil to resigvat, and uh, I don't have a, uh, have an objective data, but subjectively, currently, because the follow-up duration is very very small. approximately 2 to 3 weeks but all patients have reported improvement in functional capacity after we have started reosigvat however it's too early to say whether this uh, this effect is going to last long term or no uh, there are studies which uh, have shown effect beneficial effects of reosigvat uh, 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 reosigvat on uh, patients with throm- thromboembolic ph as well as pulmonary arterial hypertension and we have to remember that these patients are usually adult patients there are no pediatric studies we don't know what the pediatric dosages are uh, the patients in which we have tried are also adult patients so we can try this in our patients who are more than 16 to 18 years of age who are adults but definitely we cannot uh, as yet try it in pediatric patients and there is significant improvement in 6 minute walk test in patients with uh, reosigvat versus placebo so the question Should we shift from phosphodiesterase inhibitor to guanylate cyclase stimulator, especially in our teenage patients or patients who are young adults, or is it more efficacious than phosphodiesterase inhibitor? So, a real switching. So, is it safe? Yes, it has been tried, and approximately, if you see this capture study, they have uh, converted 125 patients. So, 125 patients were enrolled because they were not responding to phosphodiesterase five inhibitors, and they were enrolled to uh, uh, to convert. to dio sigvat and most of them uh, tolerated the uh, uh, tolerated the conversion well without uh, too many uh, side effects so uh, only six patients i think uh, had side effects uh, serious side effects sorry two patients out of 125 had serious side effects uh, most common was dizziness dyspnea headache and hypotension which is is anyways common in all the patients who are on all the pulmonary based drugs only two patients had very serious uh, adverse events 
one patient had polyarthritis. We don't know the reason yet as to why the patient had polyarthritis, but had to stop the medicine because of polyarthritis and one patient presented in right heart failure. So yes, it is safe. Question whether it is effective. So uh, uh, this is uh, 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 it's a corollary of the same uh, study. This is just additional data. The authors have not uh, gone critically reviewed this data and we also need to see it in that aspect because the study by itself was uh, was designed to see if it is efficacious. The next step is going to be once it is efficacious, once it is safe, the next step is going to be efficacious, whether it is efficacious or no. So as you see, only 67 patients had a uh, six minute walk test before and after, and there was some improvement, though not much. However, if you see, there is improvement in the functional class, uh, in, in more patients, one functional class one and two as compared to the uh, as compared to baseline. Definitely, it is a process cycling analog, so it is going to act at the process cycling pathway, and it has shown beneficial effects on the mean PA pressure with the PRI as well as the functional class in most patients as well as survival. It has also improved uh, survival in patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension. Again, as we have seen in the pre in previous slides, if you start a patient on this drug earlier, better. Because once we start them early, the response is better as compared to once we start them in functional class 3 and 4. A data analysis which was showing that it is helpful, especially in uh, especially if we uh, start the patients early. Other drugs which are novel therapies which are used in uh, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, the use is controversial and we'll go through it. One of them is imatinib. And there was an impress trial which was uh, done. So definite improvement in six minute walk test after imatinib. However, the problem with imatinib is there are a lot of side effects, especially subdural hematoma. This study was discontinued. My experience, I have used imatinib in two patients. In both patients, we had to stop in it because they had side effects, may uh, pancytopenia. One pin also had fever with rash with, uh, uh, for which we had to discontinue. Uh, this is also similar to, uh, uh, to the uh, to the, uh, to the studies where there is significant improvement in six-minute walk test, significant improvement in, uh, in functional class, but because side effects, uh, imatinib is not well tolerated. What can we do? Be a patient. Greater exercise and yoga, and we have gone through that. Atostomy and septectomy. Patient ECMO, heart transplant, psychosis support, and patient education. We'll concentrate on atrial septostomy and septectomy as well as portion. The uh, three which we have uh, seen so far. The septostomy do it decompresses the right atrium, increases the left ventricular preload, increases cardiac output, and improves the hemodynamics. However, a deep blood reaches the coronaries as well as the cerebral vessels. There is decompression only in diastole and uh, very high chances of the communication becoming small again. This has been addressed by using the atrial flow development. How we have to realize that uh, just a palliation uh, which we are uh, doing. I guess. What a pot shunt. It was first described in 2004 in pulmonary hydrogen hypertension. It was a series that was published by Bartow et al. in 2012. And the connection between the left pulmonary artery and descending aorta. It's a very interesting concept decompresses the pulmonary circulation and maintains normal saturation to the brain and the coronary. So only, so basically what we are trying to do is we are converting a patient who has got idiopathic pulmonary hypertension to a patient who has got a PDA with pulmonary hypertension. A patient with PDA and pulmonary hypertension has got much better prognosis as compared to a patient with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. And the echo pre uh, pre and this is the echo post portion uh, which shows significant improvement in the uh, uh, in the LV as well as the RV function. This is their uh, data. So 80% survival at the end of 10 years with redundant medication is absolutely fascinating. For our own experience, we have had 16 patients who underwent fortune, 13 surgical and 3 transcatheter. All were in function class 3 and 4. Uh, we could discharge 13 patients home, so the 3 deaths. This is survival. 
uh, most of the patient except one has got improvement in functional class with improvement in echocardiographic echogra echocardiographic parameters such as TAPSI and RV work. However, there is a group of patients who is not benefited from pot shunt. And uh, uh, these are usually older patients who are in much worse functional class uh, whose uh, RV function is very, very high, very, very low, and the NT pro BNP is uh, extremely high. In this so uh, if we see the uh, f uh, the top panel uh, is the one in which the patient has got pulmonary hypertension, severe pulmonary hypertension to say, but our function is relatively well, well controlled as to the one who has got below severely hugely dilated RARV, mild of pericardial effusion. Not only the pot trend is going to be very very high risk, the survival also the beneficial effects are also going to be minimal in such kind of patients. So. If any kind of therapy which we have to do beyond phosphodiesterase inhibitor and endothelial receptor antagonist, we don't have to wait for the patient to become very, very sick, very, very sick and symptomatic. In either of these patients, the intervention has to be done very, very early. Whatever intervention which we are doing, planning either an atrial septectomy, septostomy, it starts from the adding of prostacycline, adding of prostacycline, doing a sept uh, septostomy or an atrial flow regulator, or doing a portion or better tolerated in patients with a relatively maintained right ventricular function, the prognosis is much better if you do these interventions early as compared to if you do the intervention when the patient is in absolutely functional class score, cannot even walk 10 steps, and have pericardial effusion and severe RV dysfunction as seen in the panel below. First transplant was carried out in 1981, has become a standard or had become a standard modality of uh, treatment in patients with end-stage pulmonary hypertension. However, we have to realize that from all causes of lung transplant, pulmonary hypertension have got the worst long-term survival. So after uh, doing a lung transplant or a heart lung transplant, patient with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension has got a much worse prognosis as compared to other causes where the lung transplant is done and the prognosis is better. The center survival is 25% at, at the end of 10 years. So that itself is not very encouraging. <clears throat> so how do we, how, how is the pH uh, management changing uh, only, not only in India, but all around the world? So first therapy, as we all know, is phosphodiesterase inhibitors and endothelial receptor antagonists. Next, we also have to add, think about adding process cyclins relatively early in the disease process. And lung transplant or heart lung transplant this was what was uh, uh, this was what the strategy which was uh, used not long ago maybe maybe five years back this was the standard treatment strategy which, which was used not only in India but all over the world but especially in countries like India the process cyclists are not available lung transplant and heart lung transplant are very very difficult to carry out uh, we should start thinking of doing either a portion or an atrial flow regulator early in the disease process Conclude, therapy is just a small part in the treatment of patients with pulmonary atrial hypertension. Counseling of patients and caregivers is extremely important. Many drugs are on the horizon, and hopefully, we should be uh, providing better care to our patients. Innovative treatment strategies like atrial flow regulators and portion need to be considered. Thank you.